Monks, 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 the expert hand-to-hand -hand fighters, the zen warriors of kung fu, the punchiest boys. There is something about the image of fighting a world full of wizards, gods, and demons with nothing but the fists you were born with. You could use a fireball to destroy your foes, or you could hone your body to the point of being a living weapon and cut your enemies down like wheat in a field. That is some next level stuff right there. Monks are the ultimate David vs. Goliath character, and we all know what their most powerful, incredible, most game-breaking ability is, right? That's right, they get one free artisan tool, so they can use carpentry tools to make race car beds. Hey, thanks for giving us a place to stay. We really appreciate it. Yeah, it's no problem at all. I figured if you guys are gonna work as my security detail, and since you don't have a place to stay, I could try and make your stay here as nice as possible. I mean, we rolled a six on the skill check, but I think all things considered, we did a great job. The important bit is it's comfortable, and you can still tell it's a race car bed. You can still tell it's a race car bed. Plus, it has great gas mileage, because it's a hybrid, because it's a car and a bed. Truly an environmentally friendly bed. Saving the Earth one nap at a time. One nap at a time. Oh, well, that's a really nice toolbox you have there, by the way. Thank you. I bought it at a garage sale my neighbor was having. It's the people in the, um, uh, that wizard tower with the beachfront property. Do you smell sulfur? A demon attack? On a Sunday, no less. Monk, get him! Wild Magic Barbarian, get him! I am here for that box of tools. Huh? Well, hey there, Skilly, how you doing? Yeah, a high beach wizard. Now is not a good time. I am currently being mugged by Satan. Oh, oh, this ain't a mugging. He's just here to get that toolbox I sold ya. What? You sent a demon to my lair? Why? Yeah, well, turns out at the garage sale, you're given the wrong toolbox. You got my good toolbox. I meant to give you this one, so here ya go. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Ow. I bought something from you at the garage sale and you gave me the wrong thing. So to rectify that, you employed an unholy demonic monster? Well, that's rude. He has a name, you know. It's Pinky. You summoned Pinky the demon? He's one of the worst demons out there. He blew up a child with a fireball. Well, that was a long time ago, and I didn't want to summon him, but I tried to contact you several times, but you never responded. I didn't know you called for me. I was probably out or something when you did. Why in the world would summoning a demon be your response to something so mundane? Well, I wasn't sure if you stole my toolbox. What does that mean? I brought this from you! Well, I just wasn't sure. Hey! Okay, have a nice day now. Goodbye! That coastal wizard did you dirty, man. We're gonna get you some payback, but first, buff time. So as you can see, while the monk is very cool, it's actually pretty weak. In fact, it's the butt of a lot of jokes in the D&D community because it's just so much worse than the other class options. So why is monk bad? There are a few reasons for that, and I'm going to explain each one of these problems with cars. One, lack of key. They have a resource pool known as key, and it's a very small resource pool. Think of key as gasoline, and the monk is a hybrid race car. You can still drive around using electricity, but you need that gas to compete with the other cars in the race. And monks have a very small tank, so they can't do cool race car things for long, like drive really fast, dodge other cars, or have the car punch the other car with a flurry of wheels. Two, low damage. Compared to other classes, its damage is pretty low, mostly when you get to around level 11. It starts dropping off pretty hard there, especially when you run out of key. So our hybrid race car is more like a hybrid smart car. I'm sure getting hit by a smart car would hurt, but getting hit by that car would hurt a lot more. That car could hit like eight people in six seconds. 
maybe nine if they're lucky. Three, being too squishy. Monks are so squishy. Their AC is lower than most martial classes and their health pool is smaller as well. They only get a D8 hit die when every other martial class gets at least a D10, except for Rogue who also has a D8 in hit die. But the Rogue is a very slippery class and the Monk isn't as slippery, especially when they run out of key. I'm in danger. So our hybrid smart car, instead of getting airbags, we got like a pillow. And also this race is now a demolition derby and you just found out there are no seatbelts in this car. Four, magic items. A lot of people complain that monks can't use many magic items because they can't use armor and most weapons, which is an extremely easy thing to solve as a DM, just give them magic brass knuckles or something. But that's a topic for another time. The real problem is even when I do get a magic item, when I'm playing a monk, I don't wanna use a sword, I wanna punch. That's why I picked the punchy class. I'm level 20, why do I still gotta be swinging around this lame sword. I should be fisting my way through life loudly and proudly. If I wanted to use a sword, I'd play a fighter. I want to punch as often as possible. It's like wanting to drive an automatic transmission car, but then you're told for half the race, you gotta drive a stick shift. I don't want to drive stick. This is not what I imagined when I signed up for this Grand Prix slash demolition derby. Five, next problem is... <sighs> Stunning strike. Guys, it's not a well-made feature, it, it's really not. For those unaware, Stunning Strike lets you stun a creature when you hit them, meaning they can't do anything until the end of your next turn if they fail their saving throw. And you can attempt to do this every time you hit a creature. So you got four chances to stun a creature or even stun four creatures in one turn. It'll cost you all your key at level five, but, but you can do it. And that doesn't sound bad, so why is it a problem? Because it's written really weirdly. You can use it when you land a melee weapon attack. So that means you can only use it with weapons, right? Nope, that means you can also use it when you punch someone. Then why qualify it as a melee weapon attack and not just a melee attack? Because that's how they wrote the rules. Well, why did they write the rules that way? Because their heads are full of sand. Second problem is that DMs just hate it. Yeah, it's a constitution save and a lot of monsters have high con saves in the game, but law of averages means you're probably gonna roll low on one of those four saves you have to make in one turn. There is nothing else like this in the game where you can try multiple times in one turn to completely turn off a creature. It's just annoying and stun is annoying. I made a whole video about it. XP to level three made a video about it. The weird thing is people get really mad if you say stunning strike should get changed because stunning strike is like the only good thing Monk has going for it until like level 14. Kind of. But here's the thing, it's not even that good because a lot of monsters, again, have high con saves. So your best bet is to just key dump, punch a lot until the DM rolls low. It's not really tactical, it just feels icky. It's like having really nice looking upholstery on your car seats, but on closer inspection, you find it's full of mold and you tell your friend, hey, you gotta fix these seats. But your friend passionately refuses because those seats are the only good thing going for this stupid, tiny, beat up hybrid race car. We gotta fix this wreck. Before we do, let's check in on one D&D and see how their revision of Monk is going. Yup, pretty much as I expected. Let's go back to our thing. So we're gonna rebuild the Monk from ground up, starting at level one. If something in our Monk is the same as the original Monk, I'm most likely not gonna go into detail about it. So let's start at level one. First off, their hit die is bumped up to a D10. This is a class that quite literally gets closer to the enemy than anyone else. They should be able to take and throw a punch. Second, their martial arts die, the die that dictates how strong their unarmed attacks are, ramps up faster and goes up to a D12. This will help their damage numbers. Third, their martial arts ability. It does a few things. One thing it does is it allows you to use your dex instead of strength for unarmed attacks and monk weapons. We are going to add in that you can use your dex for athletics checks as well. These guys need good dex and wisdom and constitution, so usually a monk's strength stat tends to fall behind, so they need a little love there. Plus, I never looked at a Shaolin monk and thought, yeah, he's probably out of shape. Probably not athletic at all. It is a difference between athletics and acrobatics. Uh, shut up. Another thing we're gonna change about this ability is this line. 
When you use the attack action with an unarmed strike or a monk weapon on your turn, you can make one unarmed strike as a bonus action, blah, 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 blah. We're just gonna streamline this to say you can make an unarmed attack as a bonus action. We're doing the same with Flurry of Blows, by the way. It just simplifies things to make this way better for monks to have more versatility. You can just attack twice, or you can punch, then use your action to drink a potion. You could punch, then use your action to hide. You could use your action to do a little dance in an attempt to warm the dragon's icy heart, showing him that there's still beauty in this world and that maybe, maybe we should all be friends. Then punch him in the dick! And to avoid multi-classing shenanigans abusing this change, we're gonna change it so you can't make an unarmed attack or use your flurry of blows as a bonus action if you are wearing armor, wielding a shield, or wielding a weapon with the heavy or special properties. And you know what? You shouldn't be able to use this during a blade song because you know what? Blade singers don't need the help. Fourth, you get dedicated weapon at level one. I'm not gonna bother explaining how the original dedicated weapon works because it's stinky and bad. To help boost their damage, what our version does is it makes it so you can become proficient with any one weapon of your choice as long as it doesn't have the heavy or special property. You could even become proficient in a man's severed arm, just like any well-adjusted adult would do. So this was their worst feature, but with my update, I turned it into their best feature. But you said it's lame to have to use a sword and you want to fist your way through life. I know, I know, but you gotta wait for it. Trust me. For now, just imagine this feature as a canister of premium gas. It'll help our car go a bit faster and have the engine run smoother. Fifth and final thing to change about level one, and some people might disagree with this, but I don't care. I think monks should be able to choose animal handling as one of their starting skills. Why? It's not the best reason, but apparently stray dogs hang outside the Shaolin temple and some Tibetan temples, and some monks feed them every morning. And that's just a really cute idea to me, feeding stray dogs. Not the best reason, but I like dogs. Sue me. Everything else with level one can stay the same. Skill proficiency, saving throws, unarmored defense, all that stays the same. Let's move on. Level two. Key, you get more of it. Just take the original amount and add your proficiency bonus to it. Give the car a bigger fuel tank and it will go farther and faster. And I want these guys to go far. Also, Flurry of Blows is changed to be just a bonus action, no attack needed first. Double the Dragon Schmeckle Punchin'. Also, your key DC will be based on your dex. It's better progression, and monks can actually have a chance for creatures to fail their saves. This will make their DC able to keep up with every other class, and yes, you will be able to Stunning Strike better. I rag on Stunning Strike, but I don't think it should be tossed out. Unarmored Movement is the same. We'll keep it and move on to level three. You get a subclass, but we gotta do subclasses in another video because this one is already pretty long. Key Fueled Attack, it's gone. It's a needless ability, you don't need it. Kensei can have it, but this ability is basically do less damage to attack with a weapon instead of punching twice, which does more damage. It may have some edge cases for where it's good, but it's mostly just bloat. My character sheet already has a lot on it. I don't need more stuff I'll never use. This goes right down there with Cobbler's Tool proficiency. Also, Wizards of the Coast, how dare you try and make the monk punch less? Monk isn't some uncivilized fighter or barbarian. They came out of the womb swinging. They chopped off their own umbilical cord and they named themselves Fistopher Robin. So we are dropping key fueled attack like my parents dropped me when I was born and moving on to things I'm actually excited to talk about. Deflect missile is changed to deflect attack. First, let's explain what deflect missile is. Firstly, when it says missile, it just means projectile like an arrow or rock. It doesn't mean a nuclear missile. So if an arrow is coming your way, you can redirect it in such a way to take less damage or even take zero damage. If you reduce the damage down to zero, you can throw the projectile back at your foes as long as the projectile can be held in your hand. So while you could redirect a nuclear missile to not hit you, you couldn't throw it back. Unless I suppose you had a series of monks in an array where they kept redirecting the missile at each other until you turned said missile around and back toward its sender. The military should hire me, I'm wicked smart. Put a bunch of Jet Li clones in space. Call it a day. To increase the monk's tankiness and survivability, we are altering deflect missile so it works on all attacks, not just ranged ones. So if anyone hits you with an attack, you can use your reaction to reduce the bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. If you reduce that damage to zero, as part of that same reaction, you can make an unarmed strike against the attacker. And yes, with this change, you can still throw arrows back at people. And because I want this ability to stay good as you level up and multi-attack exists, you can deflect more attacks attacks with the same reaction as you level up. So not only does this increase the survivability of the monk, it also increases their damage output. Just imagine, a man runs at you with a weapon, his eyes full of murderous intent fall upon you, 
an unarmed individual. The thrill of an easy kill courses through him as he thrusts his sword to pierce his target. And then, the attack is deflected. He was not met with the warmth of another man's life splattered across his arm, but with a fist that could shatter bone. Side note, I played a lot of Dark Souls, and it wasn't until like earlier this year when I was replaying Dark Souls 2 that I tried parrying for the first time, and I just remember saying to myself, So this is what true power feels like. And this isn't a massive change, it's just taking an ability they already could do and expanding upon it. Also, this is the damage reduction equation you get from Deflect Missile. It's the same one I used for Deflect Attack. Uh, if you feel like it's too much for melee attacks, you can try this equation instead, maybe even this one. You might need to massage the numbers slightly to your preference. I'm going with this one for now. If I change it, I'll update it on the Google Doc where I keep an updated list of all the changes I do in these videos. One last thing we're adding to level 3 is adding the ability Robust Bot. You are immune to disease and have advantage on saving throws against poison and have resistance to poison damage. Now you can deflect attacks, anthrax, hepatitis A through E, but why add this? Well, vanilla monks become immune to disease and poison at level 10. Weirdly, paladins become immune to disease at level 3. Level 3! Monk is over here in the best shape of his life, eating right, praying to Buddha, Bahamut, Dragon Buddha, whatever, but just because this guy promised to Jesus he wouldn't lie and wears a chastity belt, he's immune to Ebola? Miss me with that. I truly do not care what the story reason is for that. From a gameplay perspective, that is some bull. And again, monks get closer than any other class to the enemy. You have to touch this thing with your hand, and this, and this thing! So we are giving part of this level 10 ability early, and we can complete the full thing later on. But for now, Level four, ability score improvements, slow fall, those stay. But this feature that Tosh has added, quick and healing, stinks. Spend two key points to get healing back equal to your martial arts die plus your proficiency bonus. So rules is written, this ability lets you spend half of your key at level four to get about five points of healing back. God, leveling up Monk is like trying to put a new stereo in a car that is actively on fire. Okay, quick and healing is bad. We're just gonna change it to require no key and give it a new name, stronger healing. Starting at fourth level, the constant flow of key throughout your body helps you repair it when injured. When you regain hit points from any source, including hit dice, you regain a number of additional hit points equal to your wisdom modifier. Monks should be absolute masters of their own body, so they can take any healing magic introduced into their system and use it more efficiently. Have someone cast Aura of Vitality and the monk will be able to heal like 9 HP every round. Level 5. Focused aim, keeping it, extra attack. Keeping it Stunning Strike. We're changing it so you can only use it once per a turn, the way it always should have been. Now, now don't freak out and leave a salty comment before finishing the video. We're gonna make them stronger in other ways. Relax. We are just changing the upholstery. I know you like the leopard print car seats, dude, but we all got ringworm from sitting in it. And it's just a really old, ugly design. By the way, you can use Stunning Strike with Deflect Attack, so a guy could hit you with his first attack, you take damage, then reduce that damage to zero, Stunning Strike him, and take away the rest of his turn, even with my changes to stun. Changes that are better than the original. Moving on. Level 6. Rope class stuff, key empowered strikes is fine, moving on to level 7. Evasion is fine, we keep it. Okay, so stillness of mind. You can use your action to end the Charmed and Frightened condition on yourself. Sounds cool, but some enemies that can Charm and Frighten also tack on additional effects with it, like Incapacitated, which makes it so you can't do anything, which is objectively not fun. How am I supposed to end an effect that won't let me end the effect? Also, ending the Charm effect on yourself when you are Charmed by that creature is weird to me. Usually, when you are Charmed, you see the Charmer as friendly, but if you are actively ending the Charm effect on yourself, you know you're being charmed and your state of mind is being altered, so if you know you are being charmed by this guy, why would you see them as friendly in the first place? D do charmed targets 
No, they're being charmed. There's some weird mental gymnastics going on here. Yeah, rules is written, you can end the effect. It's just, it just raises a lot of questions, all right? It also uses your actions, so it's not great. Wouldn't it be better if it required no action? Wouldn't it be better in the first place if you just had higher odds to pass the save to not be charmed? Gloomstalker Rangers and Samurai Fighters get proficiency in wisdom saving throws at level seven, so that's similar. But those are subclasses. It's not like a base class would do something like that. Oh, hi, level six paladin. Level six paladin gets a little feature called Aura of Protection, which gives you and every friendly creature within 10 feet of you a bonus to all saving throws equal to your charisma modifier. So normally that bonus is like a plus two, plus three if that paladin is built for high charisma. That bonus is also on top of any other saving throws you are proficient in. So a paladin saving throws looks something like this. Yeah, ending a charm effect as an action ain't looking so good now, huh? You entered a crappy smart car into a demolition derby with monster trucks. Woe be to you, Punchy McNo Charmed. So how do we fix this? Well, we don't have to come up with something new because we already have all the tools we need. This. This is probably going to be my most controversial change yet. See that part of their level 14 ability, Diamond Soul? Just, uh, we're just gonna do this. Say goodbye to stillness of mind and say hello to unwavering. It gives you proficiency in all saving throws. It protects you from charmed and frightened, just like the old feature, but now it frees up your action economy by giving you better odds. You know what's better than ending a charm effect? Not being charmed in the first place. If a paladin has saving throws like this and can give bonuses to his friends, I think it's okay for monks to have saving throws like this. Moving on. Level eight, stability floor improvement. Level nine, unarmed movement, you can run on walls, whatever, we keep it. Level 10, okay, since we split up purity of body, I guess we should give them the rest. Immaculate body, you're immune to poison damage and the poison condition. Next up, we're gonna give them an agility store disprove rent. I, I mean ability score improvement, or ASI as the nerds call it. Monks are split between needing good decks, wisdom, and con, so their stat budget is pretty stretched. So another ASI should help with that. Rogues get one at level 10, so that seems pretty in line with this. And all a rogue needs is decks. Monks need an ASI way more than a rogue does, especially if they want to take on this goofy looking chump. Before we go any further, uh, if you're enjoying the video at all, I'm assuming you are because we're like, what, 20 minutes into this? Uh, consider hitting the like button, commenting, subscribing. Like, you could just slap your keyboard and leave that as a comment, that'd be fine. But I put a lot of work into these videos. I hope it pays off and you guys enjoy it, but thank you, uh, it really helps me just pay rent, so thank you. <laughs> Level 11, we get some pub glass stuff, and here's where we take Monk up a few notches. We are going straight up to Flavortown Guy Fieri level stuff. Remember Dedicated Weapon? Well, now you get Improved Dedicated Weapon. To put simply, your unarmed attacks do what your magic weapon does if your dedicated weapon is magic. Is your dedicated weapon a regular plus one sword? Well, now you got plus one fists. Is your dedicated weapon a flame tongue? Congratulations, you now have flaming fists that deal an extra 2d6 damage on hit. Do you have a nine live stealer sword? Your fists can now rip the life force from a creature. Do you have a Vorpal Sword? You can now, mechanically, kick someone's head off their body when you roll a nat 20. Yeah, that gas canister from earlier, it's been replaced with rocket fuel. This car is gonna fly. So why do this? Well, I want monks to fist their way through life. I don't want to rely on some legendary weapon just to keep up. So why not give them legendary fists? Is it strange to give a class a feature that is reliant on magic weapons? Yeah, but the game is built around players getting magic weapons. Seriously, you can't even damage most fiends unless you have a magic weapon. Another big reason to add this is monks' damage numbers drop significantly around 9, 10, or 11. And you can see that reflected in Tasha's monk subclasses getting damage abilities around level 11, so this boosts their damage numbers up significantly. I considered giving this ability to Monk at level 1, and you can, but you really gotta be careful with what you give them at low level. I mean, that goes for magic items in general at any level with any player, but seriously, if you give this level 1 Monk a flame tongue, you might as well replace their fists with fireworks because this is gonna blow up in your face. Level 12, Hostility more Approved Dent. Level 13, Tongue of Sun and Moon. It lets you be fluent in all spoken languages. You could make up a language and the monk would know it. Also consider language evolves over time. Here's an example. Guess what language this is? If you guessed English, you would be correct. This is a passage from Beowulf in Old English. 
Yeah, things have changed. I don't even know what some of these letters are. So your monk is like dictionary.com, but always up to date on modern slang before it gets adopted into the larger public. So your monk is like the, how do you do fellow kids meme, but successful. Level 14. We took part of Diamond Soul and put it at level 7, so we will keep the part about rerolling saving throws, which is a really cool ability in my opinion, and we will add being immune to Charmed at this level. Part of the Monk Fantasy is being extremely wise and not being so easily fooled. You can already understand any language by touching the key in another's mind. It makes sense the wise old master can sense and be immune to bullsh**. Level 15. Let's skip to level 20 for a second. It is widely believed that the monk's level 20 ability, also known as the capstone ability, is underwhelming. Perfect self, if you have zero key points when you roll initiative, you regain four. That's kinda cool, but I don't know, man, that's pretty underwhelming. Level 20 barbarian is over here getting inhumanly swole. Fighter attacks four times in one turn, possibly eight or nine times. This is level 20. You gotta build some incentive to get your character there. Cause right now it makes more sense to go 19 levels into monk and go one level into anything else. Why do monk, sorcerer, and bard get the D&D &D equivalent to food stamps as their greatest ability? I'm all for safety nets, but this isn't exactly whisking me away to a fantastical realm. Okay, so we're making new capstones for these classes and I'd say move all of their level 20 abilities down to level 15. Battlemaster basically gets this ability at level 15, so it's fine. Remember, this ability is not pushing you forward in strength, it's just a safety net. Also, yeah, they get Timeless Body at level 15, which lets you be a strong grandpa and not need to eat or drink. Some of you might think that seems out of nowhere, and I did too, but it could possibly come from the story of Buddha sitting under a tree without food or water for seven weeks. I like the idea of a monk reaching such a spiritual ascension that they go beyond earthly needs. I think that's cool. Level 16, facility door improvement. Level 17, flub gas stuff. Level 18, empty body. No notes, it's great. It lets you become invisible and be resistant to all damage, except force damage. What's worse than a ghost? Only a ghost that knows kung fu. <laughs> It also lets you project you and your friend's consciousness to the astral plane. The perfect tool to absolutely derail your DM's campaign. Level 19, a bonus card perfect. Level 20. So we kicked the old capstone ability down to level 15. So what ability would convince someone to go 20 levels into Monk? What ability would make you the enlightened Kung Fu superhuman all monks strive to be? The car worthy of this deadly demolition derby. If key has always been an issue, let's let them be key masters. Key master. At 20th level, your mastery of key lets you perform basic techniques effortlessly. Flurry of blows, patient defense, and step of the wind now cost zero key to use. Also, your dexterity and constitution scores increase by four, your maximum for those scores now being 24. That last bit I stole from Triet Monk, Thank you, sir. But the logic is sound. At level 20, barbarians get super stat increases, so why not monk but with dex? And about the key thing, you can still do your basic monk stuff, but now it won't impact your key pool. So you're more free to deflect attacks, stunning strike, or become Danny Phantom. So our car now has great gas mileage, is as sturdy as a rock, and punches better. All right, I think our monk friend is ready to fight some demons. Uh, you didn't talk about subclasses. <laughs> this video is long enough, we'll get to it later. Thanks, dude. I got you, buddy. Hello! Oh, hey there, Skilly. Are you here for the yard sale? I got some more toolboxes if you want them. Are you, are you kidding me? No! I ain't buying anything from you if you're still working with demons. My boy's here to get some much needed revenge. That weird little furball is gonna try and beat Pinky the demon. You do know Pinky is immune to stun, right? Without your fancy little karate moves, you're powerless. We'll take our chances. Okay, well, Pinky, go kill him. Duel one. Let's run. <laughs> I should have three extra testicles. Destroy. Yeah! How do you like Monk now? You psycho! 
But you'll think twice before sending some goons after us, huh? Are you serious? You literally just did that. You're doing that right now. Yeah, but this was for revenge and not something stupid like you did. Totally different. You literally hired confirmed no, murder no, hobos no, to no, rough someone different. up. That is totally the exact different. same I thing. The moral you are a hypocrite. I That's what you're doing. You're just doing the exact same the thing, thing I did. You're no better than me. You're just using hired thugs as a tool. That wasn't about proving a point. It wasn't about making Monk better. If you didn't send the Monk, you'd probably send that guy with a hat to kill Pinky. You don't care about any of this. You don't care about them. You just care about winning. This whole plot line is hypocritical. Whatever. You win. I I'm out. I'm out, dude. I'm, I'm gone. Oh, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm out. Well, now what? Want to steal his stuff? Yes. Whew, that was a long one. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider liking and subscribing and leave a comment telling me if you guys think these changes were good or bad or how you would make Monk better at your table. Commenting on the video not only helps this video get into YouTube's confusing algorithm, but helps me figure out how to balance things in the future. I do read all the comments and try to respond to all of them, so thank you for that. It really does help a lot with these videos in more ways than one. If you want to help me make other things in D&D better, like buffing Sorcerer or buffing Bard, consider joining the Patreon. On it, I release playtest material before I release a video, so all my stuff is properly tested. So if that interests you, give it a look and consider joining our esteemed team of D&D dice analysts. Shout out to BuddyB31 for helping me come up with so many good improvements to Monk. I'm excited for the Monk subclass videos I'm gonna be putting out. There's gonna be a lot of cool stuff in there. If that interests you, subscribe, ring the bell, or whatever, do whatever makes you happy. Special thanks to Beefmaster, Panko6, and Manifestering for supporting on Patreon and YouTube memberships. Thank you so much. Your continued support means a lot to me and is extremely, extremely appreciated.